Hello and welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ as we celebrate today Reformation Sunday. This is a Sunday in the church year when we give thanks to God for the reformers of the past who sought to bring the church back again to the word of God alone. The word of God which reveals that Christ alone is the only way to the Father. The word of God which reveals that it is by God's grace alone that we are saved and we receive this gift from God through faith alone. We begin as always in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to join with me now in the opening sentences. Praise God for the Lord our God is King. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us praise his greatness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain to receive honour and glory and praise. He loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. I invite you to join together now in singing the hymn, God has spoken by his prophets together with people of the St. Paul's Lutheran Congregation. of the saving and gracious word that God has spoken to us. Let us come before our Heavenly Father and confess to him all of our sins so that his mercy may be given to us anew. Most merciful God, we confess to you and before one another that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words and actions. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, 
renew us and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce the grace of God to all of you. On behalf of my Lord Jesus Christ and by his command, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and also, also with, with you. you. Let us pray. Lord God, you have given all holy scriptures for our learning. Lead us to hear them, read, note, learn and inwardly digest them. Encourage and support us by your holy word so that we may always hold on to the joyful hope of eternal life which you have given us in our Saviour Jesus Christ. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first Bible reading for today is written in Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our second reading today, the Gospel reading, which is also our sermon text, is written in Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 46. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. Christ. Let us now confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. I was a spectator at a football match in Adelaide about 30 years ago, and I was getting really frustrated that the numbers on the scoreboard were not big enough to be seen clearly. So I complained to my brother who was with me, and he didn't seem too worried about it. And I couldn't understand, why don't they just make them bigger? And this was in the days before the electronic scoreboards. So I insisted that it was a problem, and I asked a few other people who were sitting nearby, and they all said to me that it was fine. And then it hit me. It was my eyes that were the problem. So a few weeks later, I saw the optometrist, and I've been wearing glasses ever since. You know, thankfully, we are blessed to live in an era where help is available to assist uh, many vision-related issues. But that's not the case for everyone. Jane, who is the wife of one of the pastors that I went through seminary with, she fell victim to what many of our parents would have warned us about years ago. Don't shoot rubber bands at people's faces. My mum used to tell me that they might, you might get them in the eye and make them blind. I didn't really take to heart what mum said. But it apparently happened to Jane in primary school. Someone shot her in the eye with a rubber band. And not only did she completely lose her sight, but she actually lost her eye as well. And she's had to have a glass eye ever since. Our eyes and our eyesight are extremely precious to us. You know, the thought of being totally blind is a, is a frightening one. And to become blind in the first century at the time of Jesus and Bartimaeus, there were far more grave consequences than today. At least today, there are still some opportunities for those who are visually impaired that were never available before. The Braille language means that those who are blind can read and write. Guide dogs means that there is some mobility and independence available. There is audio books for learning and government assistance available and, and some are able to still continue employment. You know, in fact, I work with a Lutheran pastor who was uh, totally blind. Sport and leisure opportunities are still available for some of those who are able to do so. And I think of Gerard Gozen, who was a, a, a blind Paralympian who appeared a few years ago on Dancing with the Stars. But in the time of Bartimaeus, there was no work for those who were blind. You can't have a blind shepherd. You can't have a blind carpenter. And there was certainly no welfare system. So if you were blind, you were totally dependent on the goodwill and the generosity of others. In fact, your only chance of survival was to beg, to sit all day at the roadside begging, begging for scraps, for money, for people's cast-offs. So in the first century, blindness was like a prison sentence, a sentence of hopelessness and a life of being destitute. And you can picture blind Bartimaeus sitting just outside Jericho on the road to Jerusalem, and he sits there and he listens. I'm told that when one of our senses is lost, that other senses often become more developed. And so listening is how he would have spent most of his day listening to the people walk by and their gossip, listening to the chatter of children, listening to the sounds of animal hoofs and the rumble of carts and wishing he could be mobile and make and sell things, listening to the comments of disgust and derision. People at that time thought that blindness was a judgment from God. But perhaps the hardest thing to listen to may have been listening to himself, his own thoughts of hopelessness the dark prison in which he was trapped. 
And yet, somehow, despite these limitations, he had somehow heard about the man from Nazareth, the man who heals and forgives people their sins, the man who claimed to be sent by God the Father and claimed to be the only true way to the Father. He had heard about the man who promises life, the one who claimed that he would be crucified and then raised in three days. And no doubt what he had heard had given him hope. Well, on this particular day, there is a large crowd that's traveling with Jesus. In fact, it's the exact same crowd that's heading with him towards Jerusalem. It is the start of the Palm Sunday crowd that will grow in time as he nears Jerusalem. And so for this blind man, he's got just one shot with Jesus. And so he sings out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He shouts, he screams out. It's a desperate cry. And of course, many in the crowd, they're embarrassed by him. They want him to be quiet. They hope he'll go away. And so we read in the text that they tell him, in essence, to shut up. And they do it with strong disapproval, with threat even. But he isn't deterred. He shouts out even louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. Even greater desperation in his cry. And then the king of creation stops and he invites Bartimaeus to come to him. Bartimaeus throws off his cloak. Some have said it's symbolic of his throwing off of everything that he had. And he springs to his feet and he looks to Jesus with eyes of hope and faith. And a miracle takes place. A healing and saving miracle as Jesus graciously makes him part of his family. And Bartimaeus then follows Jesus as his disciples, as his disciple and with clear vision. You know, it's interesting that even though he was blind, Bartimaeus could see far more clearly than nearly everyone on that road. He could see through the eyes of faith that in this man from Nazareth was all of God's promises fulfilled. The hope of the world was wrapped up in this man. I'm sure many of you have heard of Helen Keller, the famous author, lecturer and political activist who was completely blind and deaf from about 19 months of age onward happened through a disease that she contracted. But with the help of her teacher, Anne Sullivan, she defied all the obstacles and she became the first deaf and blind person to ever earn a Bachelor of Arts degree at university. She won the admiration of her generation around the globe. And she led a very public life. She was an advocate for many social issues. And in her work, she made friends with many famous figures from Alexander Graham Bell, Charlie Chaplin and Mark Twain. She was granted audiences with every US president that lived during her lifetime, which was a long one. 13 different presidents invited her to the White House. And somebody once asked Helen Keller, is not blindness the worst handicap a person can have? And she responded with something incredibly profound. She said, no. It is far worse to have eyes and not be able to see. Jesus said, though you have eyes, don't you see? And though you have ears, can't you hear? You see, you can have all of the earthly successes, possessions and lifestyle and power and popularity and yet be totally blind to the spiritual realities and the the truth the gift of God. You can have the greatest mind and intellect and yet be totally oblivious to the mysteries of God and the profound enormity of our spiritual need without God. I read about a man who once stood on a soapbox in Hyde Park in a corner there at London, mocking Christianity and everything that it stands for. And he boldly declared, he said, people tell me that God exists, but I can't see him. People tell me that there is a life after death, but I can't see it. People tell me that there is a heaven and a hell, but I can't see them. 
And so he finished his rant and he won some cheap applause and he climbed down from his little pulpit. But then another man struggled up onto that same soapbox. And he said, people tell me that there is green grass all around, but I can't see it. People tell me that there is blue sky above, but I can't see it. People tell me that there are trees nearby, but I can't see them. You see, I'm blind. The point is this, that just because someone is not able to see something, it doesn't mean that it's not real, that it doesn't exist, that it doesn't affect us. And it always staggers me that the people who saw Jesus with their own eyes, that they, they saw his miracles and yet they didn't believe or trust, as did Bartimaeus. You see, the real issue for many people is spiritual blindness. Or all they saw was the, the possibility of a full tummy of bread or some medical help or the fulfilment of their political hopes. Yet they failed to see that their whole life, their eternal destiny is in his hands, together with all the eternal consequences, both positive or negative. I wonder... What do you see when you look at Jesus? Do you see a defeated, sad figure dying a pathetic death on a barbaric wooden cross? Or do you see God in the flesh dying for you personally? Taking away your sins, restoring you to the Father, giving to you true life. What do you see? Do you see the one who said and taught some profound things? And he certainly did that. The one who gave a wonderful example of compassion and wisdom. And he did that too. Or do you see your saviour and your Lord? The all-powerful son of God suffering in your place out of love for you. Do you see Jesus calling you to a life of discipleship? To follow him in the way of the cross. You know, though physically blind, we can learn an awful lot from Bartimaeus and what he saw through the eyes of faith by looking at what he said on that day. Firstly, he cried out, Son of David. Now, that was a messianic term. It means the one anointed and promised by God. So to call Jesus by this name, it's an expression of faith and of trust. Secondly, he called him rabbi, or in the original Aramaic, rabuni. It's a title of honour for a teacher who is above others. It's the same word that Mary used after the resurrection. And it implies a personal relationship with this teacher, signifying that it is my teacher. It's an emphatic form of the word, meaning it, this is my master, my lord. And then thirdly, he said, have mercy on me. In other words, I have nothing to offer to you to win your love or earn your favour, but I trust everything that I need that you will provide. As Martin Luther once said famously, we are beggars, it is true. We are beggars, it is true. Bartimaeus had 20-20 vision the vision of faith. And through it, he could see his own condition perfectly. He could see himself as the, the sinner, the beggar before God with nothing to offer to God. With the eyes of faith, he could see Jesus correctly as the promised one, the chosen one from God, God's answer for the whole world. And through the eyes of faith, he could see clearly the relationship between him and Jesus correctly, that I need your mercy and you are my Lord. You know, there is nothing at all that is placed in the Bible accidentally. It's not just a coincidence that this Bartimaeus story comes immediately after some discussions between Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus, in fact, asks the exact same question of both the disciples and of Bartimaeus. He says to both of them, what do you want me to do for you? I wonder how you would answer that question when Jesus asks it of you. What do you want me to do for you? 
Well, there are two different responses that we read about in Scripture. The disciples, they were looking for places of honour and privilege. But Bartimaeus simply begs for mercy. And so the response to this question says an awful lot about what true discipleship is. Because true discipleship falls at the feet of Jesus and says, have mercy on me. Being a disciple of Jesus is not about overcoming all of life's obstacles and fulfilling our potential and having spiritual successes and glory. Discipleship is subjecting oneself daily to the mercy of Christ, throwing ourselves on him and looking to the cross where he won victory for me. Being a disciple is acknowledging my utter helplessness and admitting my spiritual blindness and then receiving the welcome, the love, the forgiveness of the living God who is mercy personified. Receiving the God who wants to bless us, the God who is on our side and working for our good. There was an elderly woman who stood on a busy street corner and she was a bit hesitant to cross because there was no traffic signal. And as she waited, a gentleman came up beside her and asked her, may I cross over with you? Feeling relieved, she thanked him and she took hold of his arm ready to cross the street. But the path that they took was anything but safe. The man seemed rather confused. He walked in a zigzag pattern. He dodged his way through the traffic. When they finally reached the curbing on the other side of the street, the woman exclaimed in anger, you almost got us killed. You walk like you're blind. Well, I am, he replied. And that's why I asked if I could cross with you. You know, sometimes it's a bit like that in our lives. That instead of grasping onto Jesus, the one who sees everything clearly, sometimes we can place our faith in the wrong things. As a Lutheran church, as a congregation, as individuals, we can easily focus on false foundations, grabbing onto the wrong things. And we might think that our clever ideas or our strategic plan is going to make the church grow and flourish. Or if we did a particular activity or modernise this or that aspect, then the Lutheran church or our congregation will go ahead in leaps and bounds. And the same applies on a personal level too, as we have those sort of expectations at times. But if our eyes are not focused on what Jesus did, then we're really just suffering spiritual blindness. We're groping around in the dark. If our faith doesn't involve repentance and seeking God's mercy again and again, then we are suffering spiritual blindness. Sadly, many people become blind to the gospel, to the truth of God's word. But that is why Christ has come into our darkness Come into our brokenness, into our fumbling in the dark and our blindness to give us true sight, to give us true hope, to bring light into our world, to give us a future, to bring salvation and freedom. And all of it, it is a pure gift of his grace alone. I pray that God would give to you 2020 vision, that you would be able to see things clearly through the eyes of faith, that you would recognise your complete dependence on God for all things, to understand that we are actually beggars before God, that you would see your salvation is tied up in the wounded, crucified Christ of Calvary, and that you would see each other as God sees us, worthy of love and in need of his grace too. And then I pray that you would see yourself as God sees you, precious, of infinite worth, and loved beyond imagination, desperately in need of his grace. Let us pray. Let us pray with eyes closed as Bartimaeus sung out to Jesus for help. Heavenly Father, We have seen the Christ and we believe in him and through him. 
Keep us from unbelief. Protect us from growing blind to your work in our life and the world. Help us to see you, to see ourselves and to see others clearly with the eyes of Christ. Continually send your Holy Spirit to give us faith to live as your disciples, trusting in the amazing grace that Christ won for all people on the cross. Amen. Please join together now in singing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. We now join together in the prayer of the church with your response invited. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our prayer. prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for the many blessings of body and soul which you have given us, although we have not deserved them. Above all, we thank you for preserving your saving word and the holy sacraments Keep the teaching of the gospel pure in your church throughout the world and give us faithful pastors to preach your word with boldness and power. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. Help all who hear the word to understand and believe. Send out labourers into your harvest and bring to faith those who do not yet know you. Have mercy on the enemies of your church 
so that they may repent and live. Protect your church in all trouble and defend it against all danger. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Show your mercy to all the nations of the world. Bless our land and the people who live in it. Help those in government and positions of responsibility to maintain honesty and truth, justice and peace. Direct all schools and places of learning so that students everywhere may learn truth and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Graciously protect us from fire and flood, from war and disease, from famine and strife and from every kind of disaster. Support all people in their proper vocation and help all those who are unemployed. Bless our arts and culture, our science and technology. Be with all widows and widowers and provide for all children who have lost their parents. Help those who are sick and in need and comfort those who are lonely and in trouble. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Bless us all as we gather here in your presence and satisfy the needs of every person. Give us your Holy Spirit and strengthen our faith through your precious word. Help us to never lose our faith, but keep our eyes always fixed on Jesus and his gracious mercy and love for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. As we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come, doing the work you have given us to do while it is day, before the night comes when no one can work. And when our last hour comes, support us by your power and take us home to your heavenly kingdom. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us join together in the prayer that our Lord has given to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favour and give you his peace. Amen.